And hey, good morning. Welcome to Breakthrough Walls. I am Ken Walls, and I'm your host. And man, do I have somebody really freaking special coming on here in a second. I'm blown away, actually, that I was able to get this guy. But um, I, hey, this guy's known as the pit bull of personal development, the world's only irritational speaker, the author of many, many books, New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestselling author. This dude is a rock star. I want to welcome my new friend, Mr. Larry Wingett, to the show. Larry, welcome to the show. Hey, I appreciate you having me. I can't wait to hear what I got to say. <laughs> yeah, I am so excited to have you on. I've, you know, I've, I've followed you for years. I've read your books. I haven't read all of them. I'm not going to lie, but I've read a couple of them. And man, you, 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 uh, you lay it out somewhere. I heard, <laughs> I heard you said made a statement somewhere. I don't know if it's in a book or something, but. It's something like your kids are stupid because you're stupid or your kids are dumb because you're dumb or something like that. Well, I did write a <clears throat> New York Times bestseller called Your Kids Are Your Own Fault. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, you know, I do have a, a series of uh, statements that I go through in my speeches that said if your uh, business sucks, it's because as a business person you suck. And if your life sucks, it's because you suck. And if your sales suck, it's because as a salesperson – you suck, and if your kids suck, it's because as a parent you suck. So wow. I run through all of those things. It's all about it's you know kind of life's your own damn fault. Take responsibility. Man, isn't that the truth? Wow. So so let's let's kind of start out with I I mean I know a little of your backstory, but I, I'm interested in hearing a little more about it. Like where were you where were you born and raised? I grew up dirt poor, Muskogee, Oklahoma. I truly am an Okie from Muskogee. <laughs> And uh, really, and uh, I lived there a long time until uh, I got out of college. I went to college, at Northeastern Oklahoma State University. My dad worked for Sears Roebuck for 47 years, and we raised chickens on the side. So there you go. Wow. When I was 13 years old, my story was when I was 13 years old, I walked into my eighth grade civics class, and a kid turned and looked at me and said, Hey, Winget, you support you? Only got one pair of blue jeans. And uh, yeah. I did. I only had one pair of blue jeans. They had a rip in the pocket. You, all your jeans can't have a rip in the same spot, you know? Yeah. And it was so humiliating to me because the last thing a 13-year-old boy wants to be embarrassed by uh, it is about how, he, how much money he's got, how he looks and all that in front of a bunch of little 13-year-old girls. Yeah. And it was humiliating. And right there, that quick, I made up my mind. Nobody was ever going to make fun of me for being poor. Wow. Never again in my life. And I walked out, and I still remember the kid's name, and uh, I bumped into him about three years ago here in <clears throat> Phoenix, Arizona, the kid who said that to me. No and kidding. In my mind, I was going to do whatever it took, but nobody would make fun of me for being poor again. Now, is he, li is he living in a trailer? <laughs> yeah, as a matter of fact, he is. <laughs> <laughs> he really is. Wanted to borrow money from me. Oh, my God. Wow. You should have bought him one of them pairs of jeans that have, have they come pre-ripped <laughs> and sent yeah, them to him. Yeah. Wow, man. That is crazy. It's funny how it all comes around, isn't it? Yeah. And, uh, you know, your show's about breakthroughs. That was my breakthrough. It was that moment of humiliation. Yeah. See, I don't think these days we're allowing people to feel moments of humiliation. We save everybody from everything. Amen. And uh, it was that moment of humiliation and embarrassment. Today, that would be called out by the teachers as bullying. <laughs> it was the best thing that ever happened to me right? because it was my motivation, my drive, my impetus to change my entire life and break away from the history of my entire family. And yeah. so I worked my ass off from that day on. I would, the first thing I did when I went home that day is I asked my grandpa, you got anything I can do to make some money? And he said, I got some trees. I'll give you a dollar and a half a tree to trim trees. Dollar and a half a tree. Wow. And some of those trees were eight feet tall and some of those trees were 40 feet tall. But I got a dollar and a half a tree. And I said, I'm going to trim trees till I get enough money to buy a new pair of blue jeans. And he goes, all right. And I trimmed trees till I got enough money to buy one pair of blue jeans. But I started working my ass off. 
And that's what we do. We don't let people feel the pain of their situation yep. and then go out on their own, take responsibility and do the work to correct it. Man, we got, we got, I don't, I don't remember anybody ever making fun of my jeans, but I can remember cause I grew up dirt poor too. I can remember that like all the other kids, are, now this is way back in the day, right? So I, all I got were like the, the cheap knockoff jeans and, and all my friends are wearing Levi's and Jordash and all these. And I'm like, Look, nobody worked for Sears. I wore Robux. <laughs> right. Right. Robux. Wow. You know, I was in the mall with my eight year old daughter the other day and we, we were looking for something in particular and we walked past a Sears that's closed and yeah. it was an anchor store. So sad. What's happened. She goes, daddy, yeah. what's that? And I said, that's a, that's a, Used to be a store there, Sears. It's crazy. Yeah, the biggest retail store in the world. Right? What happened? Yep. What do you think happened to them? I mean. Oh, it's a long list of stuff that happened to them, but I think they kind of forgot who they were when they went brand central and all those sorts of things. They would have stuck with Kenmore and Craftsman. They could have uh, ridden those two brands right there into eternity. Yep. But they started trying to be all things to all people. Look at my industry. People try to be all things to all people. Yep. You know, if there's anything that you, that I've learned about who I am and what I do in this business is I cannot be all things to all people. I am an acquired taste. I get a very small percentage of the market and I'm happy with that. But everybody knows who I am as a result of that. And that's what retail stores have to remember. That's what people who do podcasts when you write a book. They're trying to make everybody happy. Can't do it. Wow. Right there. That that right there was, was worth the worth getting you up early to get on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Might have been for you. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 you grew up and, and, and you had that, that moment at thirteen years old yeah. and, and decided I am never gonna be poor, I'm never gonna be made fun of again. Yeah. And you just worked your ass off. So, it. It, it, but like, so you went through high school. I mean, I'm assuming you got that, that new pair of jeans. I'm, assu did. I'm assuming you, you worked your way through high school and into college and through college. Did your parents pay for your college? Let me tell you, I went to school a semester. Then I took off a semester and work to have enough money for the next semester. Yeah. And it took me a long time to get through college because that's the way it was. I'd work a semester and save up enough money to go for another one. Right, right. People don't understand that, do they? They just don't get that. No, they don't get that. You know, somebody's going to pay for everything, and by God, they ought to. Everybody owes me a college education. Bull. I appreciate my college education. Not that I did anything with any of it, but what I learned from it is that hard work and perseverance is the lesson that carries you through life, not the classes that you study. You know, I have a degree in psychology, but that I. Maybe that applies to what I do these days. I don't even ever think about it. Never did think about it. Right. But knowing that I had to get up and go to work every single day to, so I could go to college. Right. That's the lesson I learned. Right. Right. So along the way, though, you know, I, because people can look at and, and you and I, you know, we see this where people look from the outside. They see Larry wing it, all he's accomplished, all, all, all your books, all your awards, everything. I mean, you're a hall of fame speaker too. Like, like you, you make it look easy. Has, ha, was it all e just easy? Like you just, you worked a semester, you went back to school, eventually you like everything was good. You got out of college, started making a million dollars a year. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I went to work for Southwestern Bell while I was in college, and uh, I was a male telephone operator for the Bell system. Me and 153 women. Oh, I worked okay. nights. I'd, I'd go to work at 10 at night, get off at 7 in the morning, drive an hour to get to college, uh, go to school till 3 in the afternoon, come back home, take a nap, get up, do my homework, and go back to work. Wow. And uh, that's, that's what I did. But no, it wasn't easy. I worked for Southwestern Bell for a lot of years. I went from being a male telephone operator to the till I was the uh, area sales manager for AT and T for the state of Kansas. Wow! And uh, then uh, Bell System went through divestiture and broke up. Yeah. And uh, I bailed. They gave me a golden parachute. They gave me a year's salary to go away. <clears throat> wow! 
I took my one year salary and I went back to Oklahoma. I was in Kansas at the time and me in Wichita, Kansas, I, too damn cold for me. So I went back to Oklahoma and, uh, and I started my own little telecom company. Did real well doing that. Till one day, uh, the corporation commission ruled that what I did wasn't going to be legal anymore, and they didn't grandfather me in. I was in shared tenant services, oh. and uh, that's now it's not a big deal at all. Back then, it was a brand new thing, and they decided individual companies couldn't do that after I'd already built a company and had twenty people working for me. Oh, so man. I went to work one day again, <clears throat> pretty well off. Went home that day. I'd lost everything. So everything. Uh, yeah, I lost everything. So, and wow. uh, yeah, and, uh, you know, I was like the guy, I mean, we had a garage sale every weekend. I didn't have any money. Uh, I'd put everything that we owned. Uh, we, put, we put everything we owned at, except for our beds uh, out in the front lawn every weekend, just trying to sell it to have enough money to do all the things we needed. I was like the guy who lost everything he had except for his bicycle and it didn't have any seat, and didn't have any handlebars. He had lost his ass and didn't know which way to turn. Yeah, right. <laughs> That, that was me. So, yeah, I've been up and I've been down. But uh, my wife said, what are you going to do now? I said, because she worked with me, too. She came from the Bell System as well. So we had that company. And I said, you're going to have to get a job and I'm going to be a speaker. And she said, what, do you really know anything about it? I, said, I wrote a lot of training material for AT&T and uh, sales stuff. And I'm going to write six little sales courses. And I'm going to get on the phone and sell them. And I sold 45-minute sessions for $50. Oh, my and gosh. I, called, I got the Yellow Pages out in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I started at the A's. And I called everybody, everybody in the Yellow Pages. Wow. And I said, you got any salespeople? And I got to where I could do six of those a day, starting at 7 in the morning and then at 7 at night. Six of those 45-minute sessions a day. Wow. At 50 bucks a pop. 50 bucks a pop. And that's where I earned my chops as a speaker because I'd speak to one person. I'd speak to 40 people. Anybody had 50 bucks, I'd come in and give you 45 minutes on six different aspects of selling. Wow. Uh, from opening the sale to closing the deal to handling objections, all that stuff. And I learned how to stand in front of people and talk and be funny and keep them interested and, you know, pretended I gave a damn and all that stuff. And, uh, you, know, you said so pretend. <laughs> Pretended I gave a damn. Yeah. Oh, wow. And uh, about six months into that, a guy heard me and uh, said, you know, join the National Speakers Association. And I didn't have any money to do that, but I did. And a guy uh, uh, just fell out of a, a thing that he was supposed to do. And I substituted for the National Speakers Association. And six months from the time I went to business, I was doing a general session at the National Speakers Association on stage in front of a thousand professional speakers. Wow. That's insane, man. And you didn't even know what you, you had no, no formal training in it or. Oh, no, 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 no. You just I was a good storyteller. I was a good storyteller. And I thought, uh, you know, I, everything I look at now, I found uh, my mom uh, died last year and I was going through all of her old stuff and I found a bunch of report cards and uh, my report card said, Larry likes to talk too much. Larry thinks everything is a joke. Larry makes a funny story out of everything that happens. And I thought everything I ever got in trouble for is now what I get paid for. <laughs> That's awesome, though. That is awesome. Wow. So, so you here you are now. You're a, you're a, you, so you became a professional speaker. What did your wife say when you said that? I mean, it had to be a little bit more than do you, do you know what you're doing? Like, <laughs> what, what? Yeah, she believed in me and loved me. And she said, well, you can go try that. And she went and got a job. And, uh, wow. and uh, I, you know, I was used to being the company president. And now I would come home at night and go knock on my neighbor's door saying, can I mow your yard? Wow. And uh, I was doing anything in the world. So she did know that I would do anything in the world. My ego was never in the way when it, come, when it came down to taking care of my family. Yep. I did whatever it took. I, you know, I wasn't too good to do anything. <clears throat> but I was willing to get out and knock on doors and call people. And uh, I don't believe in rejection. You know, it doesn't bother me at all. I can ask a million people if that's what it takes. So yeah, I started speaking and I did pretty good. And I went from charging uh, $50 a speech till I charged considerably more than that at this point. Yeah. And uh, you know, I was, 
sort of a typical motivational kind of a speaker at that point. Yeah. And uh, I got to about 10 years into it. I got <clears throat> really kind of fed up. I didn't like who it was. Didn't like what I had to say. Didn't like the folks I was saying it to. Got to where I just didn't like much of anything from my life. And even had a point where I didn't like my wife and my business. And I had a manager working for me. And I said, listen, I can't do this anymore. And uh, I got to figure out some things. And I got in my car and left Tulsa and I drove to Sedona, Arizona and parked my car, stayed in a little hotel and I had a big stack of books and a, a boom box with a <clears throat> big set of CDs to listen to, a box of cigars and a good bottle of whiskey. And I said, I got to figure out who Larry Wiggett is again. And um, in the middle of that. In Sedona, Arizona. Yeah. Isn't that like the meditation capital or something? Of yeah, and I didn't kind of know that. I just oh, yeah. started that. Uh, and I just sat there and I'd smoke a cigar and I'd have a drink. And I'd read a little bit and listen to some music. And I turned on the TV and I heard Dennis Miller in an interview. And Miller uh, at that point had left Saturday Night Live and he was off doing his own thing. And he said, here's what comedians do. He said, they go on stage to endear themselves to the audience so the audience will like them, knowing that if the audience likes them, they will laugh. He said, my problem was I was never very endearing. So I gave it up. And instantly when he said, I was never very endearing, so I gave it up, I said, I'm not very endearing either. I think I'll give it up. And I called Rosemary and said, I don't know what the business is going to look like, but it'll be different. Wow. Let's figure something out. And I said, and I'm leaving Oklahoma and moving to Arizona. <clears throat> she said, uh, okay. And so I called my manager and I said, I don't know what the business is going to look like, but I can't do it the way I've been doing it. Now, I was already hired to do a speech two weeks after that. I went on stage and a guy heckled me. And when he heckled me, somehow something in my brain exploded. And I turned on him and said, you know, buddy, you ought to shut up, stop whining and get a life. <laughs> and uh, the audience gave me a standing ovation at that moment. Wow. And, I, and when I said, shut up, stop whining and get a life. And in my head, I went, eh, you know, that's a pretty good line. I ought to hang on to that line. And then I started making a joke. I was going to go away. So I started telling that story in the speech. And uh, I said, one of these days, I'm going to write a book called Shut Up, Stop Wanting and Get a Lot. And, uh, you know, then one of these days I did. And I wrote <laughs> Shut Up, Stop Wanting and Get a Life. And it immediately went to number one on the bestseller list. Wow. Dude, that is insane. And while the book was out there, number one on the bestseller list, A&E had just produced a new television show and they were looking for a host. And one of the producers was walking through the airport, saw my book and said, it's a good title from the picture. He's got an attitude. Let's see if he can talk. And they called me, sent a guy with a camera <clears throat> to my house. I did an interview and they hired me on the spot to become the host of A&E's Big Spender. Oh my God. Wow. That's that's incredible. All because somebody made fun of your single pair of ripped jeans. It's exactly right. It's true, right? Yeah, it's exactly that's, right. That's the fuel. I love it. And this. see, today, if somebody makes fun of them, we've taught our kids to fold. Yeah. We, we will sue them or we'll go to the teacher or we'll do whatever. Or, we're, you know, you have kids right now committing suicide over less than that. That's insane. Because man. mom and daddy didn't teach him how to be tough and suck it up in many cases. Wow. I, <clears throat> I, I you know, I, my wife gets, gets, gets mad at me, but I, I told my eight year old daughter, I said, anybody messes with you, which they have. I said, if it comes down to it, smack them across the face. <laughs> like I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I will, I refuse to raise my kids that way, man. I just won't do it. Like I, I, we didn't, I'm 50 years old, man. When I was a kid, we, we had bullies and we fought. We worked it out. You know, there are bullies in the work at pl workplace every single day. You've worked for a bully. Yep. Uh, I've worked with a lot of bullies. Yep. And uh, people think I'm a bully just because I shoot straight and tell the truth. But the deal is you can't have a bully unless you have a victim. We are trying to make it illegal to have bullies. What we ought to do is teach people, especially our children, not to be a victim. Amen. I would never have been allowed to be a victim. My dad wouldn't have allowed it. 
There's your next book. That's your next book right there. (laughs) Stop teaching your kids to be a damn victim. You know, there's a whole chapter about that in my uh, parenting book, Your Kids Are Your Own Fault, about victimized people. And, and, you know, that's what my book, Grow a Pair, is about. Yeah. How we become a victimized society. Damn, grow a pair. Stand up for yourself. Speak up for yourself. Know what you believe in. What are your core values? What can nobody ever talk you out of that you believe in so much that you'll fight for that? God, dude, this is freaking powerful. Okay, so... Um, I'm going to buy every single one of your books today. There you go. <laughs> so, so you made a little bit of money on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, authors, we make about 25 cents for every book that's sold. Oh, I know. I got, I got a book. I wrote a book. I know. I'm like, I'm going to get rich now. And I'm like, no, no, didn't happen. So, so um, man, you got a lot of fans watching right now, by the way, on the live stream. So oh, I appreciate it. Yeah. And, and, and I know that there's some people that there's people already saying they're going to get your book. So, Good. um, you know, so, so you, um, I want to back up to you. So you, you went to Sedona, you, you had a moment, um, yep. you, you drank some whiskey. What kind of cigars do you smoke? Oh, I uh, like a bunch of different ones. Right now, I'm on uh, uh, Cohiba Red Dot Maduro. It's awfully good. My favorite brand overall would be La Flor Dominicana. Just about anything they make. Yeah. Wow. I'm I'm a huge Cohiba fan. So, that Red Dot Maduro is awfully good. I'll bet. Tell them I posted this week. I posted uh, I was standing cooking a steak. I'm speaking uh, soon for the National Barbecue Association again. I spoke to them four years ago. I'm going back to do them here in a couple of weeks. And, uh, and uh, I was cooking a steak, and my wife shot a little video, and there I was. I reverse seared it. I smoked it. I was searing it off in some cast iron with a little butter bath, you know. Uh, it was so beautiful. It was these ribeye caps. And, and immediately, uh, this guy said, uh, you might be a smart guy, but nobody ought to listen to you. You don't eat healthy, you drink whiskey, and you smoke cigars. <laughs> I said, I'm a grown ass man and I didn't ask for your opinion. <laughs> right. Right. Send him your book. Now make him buy your dang book. So, you know, and that's the thing. Again, I think that when you have a lot of people, a lot of people you you know, get picked on in school. Um, they get they go through, they get made fun of because they have one pair of jeans with a rip in it. Or, or whatever happens, right? Life happens, and it, it makes them stay stuck. They get yeah. stuck. They don't know what to do to get unstuck. They want to reach for the next rung in life, but they're terrified to leave that job to do it. And, and dude, I've been there, too. I've been there where I'm like, well, we're screwed, honey. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we're just going to have to figure this out. Like, we got to put our heads down and go. And not give up and not look back, right? So, yeah. but, but what what would you say to somebody that that is stuck? They don't know what to do. They really don't. They're they're in that place where it's like, I want to take a risk. I want to take a chance, but life isn't moving the the direction I want it to. What what do you say to help them get over that? Well, first of all, you said they really don't know what to do. I don't ever buy that. I think everybody knows something they could do to take an action on. Now, it might not be the thing that is the answer to them, but they know something they could do to move from where they are to someplace else. You got to be willing to do it. You know, the problem is we allow ourselves to suffer in comfort. I believe in pain. I believe you ought to hurt as much as you can. I think you ought to sit down, hang your head and cry like a damn baby. And then get over it, get up, dust yourself off, and do anything. I don't care what it is. Like I said, the most humiliating thing was to come home and walk next door to my neighbor and said, listen, I'm kind of a tight spot these days, lost my business. I mean, could I mow your yard? Wow. And, you know, it was sucking up, and it was humiliating, and I hated it. Yeah. And I filled my yard every weekend with my – our furniture, yeah. but I did what it took because I had a commitment to my commitments yeah. and people let themselves out of their commitment to their commitments. What are your commitments? Well, first of all, if you're married, you, you made a commitment to each other. Yeah. 
And if you have kids, you didn't make a commitment. You created that commitment. And I don't care what you have to do or how damn embarrassed you are. I don't care how humiliated you are. You take care of your damn kids. There is no excuse. None. You take care of your kids. As long as it's legal and moral and ethical, you go do it. Wow. Past, past that, your commitments are your bills. You said you would make your house payment. You said you would make your car payment. We have commercials on television and on the radio said, uh, that say you don't have to make your credit card payments. The credit card companies don't want you to know this. Well, in other words, go screw yourself and your credit forever, which will affect your employment. It'll affect your insurance rates. It'll affect what you pay for everything for the rest of your life. Your bills are your commitments. Yep. Take care of your family. Take care of your kids and your spouse. Take care of the bills. You signed your name. You said you would. A deal's a deal. Do it. Now, do you have the perfect answer? Probably not. But there's something you could do. And action creates more action and action creates momentum. Get some momentum going. The, uh, the, I mean, honestly, we think so much alike. I, I, I have gone out and, you know, I, I, I went through a divorce years ago and, and a buddy of mine said, you can crash on my couch for a little bit while you get it all together. Well, I was moping around for about 60 days and he finally came to me. He's a retired doctor came to me and said, I know you don't have any money, so here's 20 bucks. You need to get your ass out of my house, get your own place, grow up, grow a pair. <laughs> he didn't say grow a pair, but he said grow up, take responsibility for your life, quit moping around, and do something. And I, I had, I was, I really felt like I wasn't employable. So I went out and, and started knocking on doors selling website development services because that's what I do. I just started knocking on doors that day until I finally, at, at the end of the day, I ran into somebody. If you've never been out knocking on doors, I th honestly, Larry, I think everybody should make their kids go get a job at 18 years old knocking on doors for the first two years of life as an adult. I agree with you. I think that, that we'd have a whole lot less problems in this world because that's sure. work. Yeah, it is work. But see, right now, there's somebody out there creating a government program for people who have gotten a divorce and are sleeping on their buddy's couch. <laughs> right. You're right. And, you know, and, when, and the solution is universal basic income, which is the new next idea that we're just going to pay you for, oh, let me see, breathing. Right. Life is about contribution. And the reason people get stuck and the reason they mope is they don't feel they are making a contribution. I don't care if you can't find a job. Go to the park and pick up trash and walk over there and put it in the can. Make a contribution to society. I honestly believe that if you did that long enough, somebody would pay attention and you would win on that deal. Dude, amen, man. And that's the other thing is just do like everybody's looking for if... I've done so, and I'm sure you have, you know, you do so many things for free <clears throat> in hopes that somebody's going to recognize you, right? You do so many things where you even lose money in hopes that somebody will recognize you. And, and right. if you do it long enough and hard enough, what happens? Somebody recognizes you. Right, right. That's it. So, I know. I, yeah, but that's why I'm so opposed to universal basic income. Amen. We, our self-worth comes from a contribution and the value we add. We, and the value we add can be, in society's mind, so insignificant. Yeah. But in your own mind, just picking up trash at a park, just when you're walking into a mall, if you see crap laying on the ground, stop and pick it up. There's trash can up there. It won't hurt you. You say, well, it's not my job. Let it be your job. Yeah. Let it be your job. And put your damn shopping carts in the damn <laughs> corral. You're going to love all my books. I talk about that in one of my books. Oh, do you really? <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, it pisses. I get so pissed off watching people push their carts to their car and then just shove it in between two other cars. Like, I... I Listen, that's in my newest book, What's Wrong With Damn Near Everything. And oh, it's listen. about the collapse of core values. And see, I believe right there, that is an example of the loss of core value of respect. Yeah. 
It is, man. And it's not, I don't even, I, I, I've often wondered, like, is it, is it really, is it really like a loss of self-respect? Is it, a, what's it about? Like, what is that? Loss of respect for others. When somebody cuts you off in traffic, it's not because they're in a hurry. It's because they don't respect you and your time enough to allow you to have the road. It's right. about them not respecting you. You're right. If somebody leaves their cart out there, their shopping cart, they don't respect you. It's not about self-respect. They don't give a damn about you. They don't care where you have to park or what you have to go through. I pulled into the the the, the store, I don't know, it's been a few months ago, and this girl is driving her boyfriend. I'm sure he didn't have a license. And and she she push it. I'm getting ready to turn into my parking spot right next to their car. She pushes her cart into the middle of the parking spot that I'm turning into and turns around and walks over. And I'm like, I swear, had I been carrying a gun, <laughs> I was like, I, that did not just happen. But people don't care anymore. No, they don't care. It's because they don't respect you. She didn't care. And see, I am the guy that stops my car, gets out and say, excuse me, did you want me to move this for you? Because you, you obviously don't want to. Did you not realize that other people want to park here? Yeah, I, I actually have those conversations. Oh, I know, man. It drives me. It drives me crazy. I got out and said a few few words. She ignored me, <laughs> got in her car, and left. But you know, so so Larry, what do you think the um, in your opinion? And I know you have one. Did I just get blurry all of a sudden? I think my uh, my autofocus got messed up. There we go. Um, what, in your opinion, what is the, the number one thing that holds people back from experiencing, you know, everybody uses financial as the gauge and, 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 and so we'll just go there. Um, it is a great gauge. I love money, right? Measurement. Yeah. So, so what do you think it is that keeps people from, from experiencing massive success in life? What's the number one thing? Maybe not top two things. <clears throat> I'll tell you, it comes down to not understanding the pain and the problem you solve in the world. Mm. If I know that there is a pain and I know what causes that pain, in other words, you got pain and a problem causes pain. Yeah. You have a solution to some problem that causes somebody's pain. Right. If I can alleviate somebody's pain, they will pay me whatever that is worth. The more cost of the pain, the more worth of the solution that I bring to it. But everybody focuses on them and success comes from solving the problems of others. And so when you focus on this, the problems and the pain that you have a solution to, and you find people out there who are going through something that you have a solution to, that's where success will come from. But it's always outwardly focused, never inwardly focused. How can I increase my value to the marketplace by solving the most number of problems? And if those problems cost somebody a lot, then you can charge a lot. Wow, I love that. But you know, there's a huge variance in, um, and I, I know I, I, I do business with and know a lot of speakers. Jeffrey Gittimer is a good friend of mine. Bob Berg's a good friend of mine. Hopefully someday I can say Larry Winget is a good friend of mine. Um, but like, you know, I know that there are huge variances in speaker fees, for example. I know, I know people that'll go speak for $5,000 and I know people that won't, won't even talk to you if you don't have 50000 to offer them. So like, why? And I'm talking about some, it, these people are in the same, probably when it comes to, to motivational speaking, they're probably very similar in their messages, but there can be a huge variance in, in what they get paid. What, what, why? I don't get that. <laughs> I, and I'm not talking about just speakers. I'm talking about Sears and Roebuck, right? I mean, yeah. there's, there's, they, you know, at one point, the craftsman tool, there's nothing ever made better than a craftsman ever, right? So they got top dollar for it. Here's what you got to realize, though. A screwdriver is a screwdriver is a screwdriver. And a speech is a speech is a speech. I got a handful of 
points, principles that I talk about. Take responsibility, be flexible, lighten up. I am not the only guy that talks about taking responsibility in your life. Right. I'm the only guy who talks about it the way I talk about it. That's right. <laughs> you so, are. Uh, somebody asked a friend of mine in the speaking business, they went to him and said, listen, I know what I charge and I know what you charge and you charge a whole lot more than I charge. And then I know what Wingate charges. And yet we're all saying the same thing. And my friend said, let me help you with this. There are a thousand of you. There are a hundred of me. There's one Wingate. <laughs> and oh, so God. when you can look at your dry cleaners the very same way, yep. it doesn't matter what you do when you can say there's a thousand of them, there's a hundred of them, but there's one of me. <clears throat> the smartest thing I ever said, somebody asked me one time, what's the smartest thing you ever said? Discover your uniqueness. Learn to exploit it in the service of others. And you're guaranteed success, happiness, and prosperity. You got to discover your uniqueness, not what makes you different. People won't risk money on different, but unique you can charge a premium for. Wow. Nobody can say it like I can say it. That's what makes me unique. Nobody looks like I do when they say it. Nobody's willing to be Larry Wingett other than me. Nobody's willing to have haters like I am. <laughs> I'm willing. You can't have rabid fans unless you're willing to have rabid enemies. So that makes me unique. My bluntness makes me unique. Hell, the mustache makes me unique. Uh, all of it. Yeah. When you put all that together, I have a unique approach. It's not that my content is unique. Speakers come into the business. People write books. Uh, uh, and they, they think that they have a unique approach because of their content or because of their talent even. Content, I can get better content than anybody can write in a book or come on stage in a five-minute Google search. Yep. Yeah. So what makes the difference is me. I love and, it. Yet, and yet that applies if you're an auto mechanic. That applies if you're running a dry cleaners or a roofing business or a plumbing. It doesn't matter. You have something that makes you unique. Exploit that in the service of other people, which means bring value to the marketplace, solve big problems for others, and they'll pay you. Wow, I love that. I, you know, um, our, our buddy Scott McCain, talks about that 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 uh was it a cab he driver a he has distinction and being iconic yeah yeah was it was it a cab driver or an uber Terry driver Jackson. yeah that he tells Thank that story you, yeah so like that but that's what and i've tried to explain to uber drivers like hey dude we're in miami where it's like six thousand degrees you have any water no man no i don't have i'm like you know, that might actually separate you from everybody else and get you more tips, but they don't, they don't care. They don't care. As long as the Uber driver does not talk to me, I'm happy with the ride. <laughs> that is I'm so not awesome. looking for a new best friend or conversation. I want to get from where I am to the next place safely and move on. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. Well, well, listen, I don't want to keep you all day. And, and, I appreciate know, it. I, I want to I want to say you know huge thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule, um, and how how can everybody follow you and do you have a central location where they can get your books and sign up for anything you got? You can uh, go to to uh, Larry Wingett fan page on Facebook, Larry Wingett on Twitter. You can go to larrywingett.com. I do a podcast called The Real Man Podcast, where I, I believe men are in trouble in society right now. Amen. And I don't believe anybody's teaching boys how to be men. And uh, we have as many women listeners as we do men listeners, where we talk about core values of being a good person. So that's a, a place they could go is that podcast. You can find everything you want about me just go to larrywingett.com. Follow me where you can. You can buy my books anywhere. Amazon's got a bunch of them. I got some of them. Man, I love it. Is there? Do you have any last words you would say to everybody on here? To if somebody's struggling at this moment, they need to get unstuck. They don't. They don't really understand. I mean, I know you say they know what to do, but if, what if they're telling themselves they don't? That person is just stuck. What do you say? Stop telling yourself you don't know what you can do. I'll tell you right now, you probably really don't know the ultimate thing you should do, but there's something that you could get off your ass and get up and do that would move you from where you are to a better place. If you honestly can't think of anything in this world you could do, walk your ass down the street and pick up trash today. 
I'm seriously. Just just take a bag and pick up some trash. You're making a contribution to society. You'll feel better about yourself. And tomorrow you'll be able to take a bigger action. But do something. Wow. That's powerful. And I agree with you, man. Take action like that and the idea will come to you. I love yep. it. I love it. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's been fun. Hey, thank you for coming on. I appreciate you being here. And thank you to everybody that's been on and shared this out. Larry, thanks. Have a great day. You betcha. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.